inside the board and free from the hive mind, this is Rex Bear hosting Leap Project. The Leap Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leap Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. All right, so Dr. Brown, it's great to have you on the show. I saw the video that you put together with Dick and um, Daz for the Phoenix Lights. I know back in the late 90s when that event happened, there was a lot of stuff that went around on the internet and other forums and newspapers, and so many people saw these, these Phoenix Lights that it really did send a shock around the world. But then a couple weeks or a few weeks later when the government came out with the official reason as to why it happened, they tended to mock those that thought it might be some type of extraterrestrial encounter. And with the Farsight Institute that you have, um, that you direct, incredible remote viewers, and when I watched this video, I, I watched the, you know, first you had Daz up there putting together actually what he saw, and he was writing it out on the, uh, on the whiteboard, and he kept putting together these geometrical shapes that looked like pyramids. You know, it looked like a, uh, like a triangle, basically. So, but I just wanted to ask you, what was it that made you decide to remote view Phoenix Lights? Well, Rex, look, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question because everyone always asks, why do we pick a particular project? And you have no idea how many suggestions for projects were emailed every day, meaning people say, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? So, you know, why do we do what we do? That's a real good question. Well, with the, with the Phoenix Lights, it was clearly an extraterrestrial type of target. By the way, when the government came out with its explanation, it said they sent a flight lieutenant out to have a news briefing. And it was six months after the Phoenix Lights. So the government was silent for six months. And the news media was essentially, mainstream news media was essentially silent as well. However, the, the lights themselves were not just lights. First of all, they were witnessed over five states, including Sonora, Mexico and potentially hundreds of thousands of people, but definitively over Phoenix alone, where they hovered for the longest time, was for over an hour, was uh, at, uh, at least tens of thousands of people in Phoenix alone, including the governor of the state, Fife Symington. So there was a huge number of witnesses. Now, when we do projects at the Farsight Institute, we work with the absolute best remote viewers on the planet, and we are training new remote viewers, but We've been, remote, we've been doing projects with Dick Algar from Hawaii and Dick Daz Smith from the UK for a number of years. And those two are really the best on the planet right now. And they use military procedures that were developed by the U.S. military and used for espionage purposes. But they're a little bit, and I don't mean this in a, in a, in a uh, critical sense at all, but they're a little bit like prima donnas. And I am too, I guess. <laughs> and they get they get a little bit finicky, and what they really really want is mainstream acceptance with what they do. And so they have always hesitated to have like remote viewing targets that involve extraterrestrials because they didn't want the extra woo woo factor of UFO extraterrestrial stuff. They wanted people to focus on the remote viewing stuff itself. So for years, I promise them, don't worry. I won't give you any extraterrestrial targets. No, no, I won't give you any UFO type targets. And of course I was lying because I can never tell them what I will or will not do. And, <laughs> but I wanted them to be surprised when it happened. And I waited until I thought it was solid that they were believing that they'd never get one. And <clears throat> fearing that they might quit on me if I did it twice, I constructed a project that had three UFO type, extraterrestrial type, alien type, targets at once and there were four targets and they just thought they were going after some single thing but the common theme was extraterrestrial UFO type things and so the first one was the so-called face on Mars in Cydonia and the reason I chose that one was because it had a clear NASA picture with very clear perpendicular and parallel lines on it that could not have been naturally made because nature doesn't make perfectly parallel and perpendicular lines so, uh, and like a border around the thing. So uh, that was clearly an anomaly that had to be answered. We had, a, an, uh, we had an official 
set of pictures from an official governmental source. Then we dealt with an alien facility that was on a wall of a crater in Iapetus, a moon of Saturn. And the reason I took that one is it was very clear in the photo that there was some set of structures on the wall of the crater, something that was obviously not made by just a meteor crash. And so we had, again, an official governmental photo released by NASA, taken by the Cassini space probe, and what is that on the wall of the crater? So again, we had something that was not in dispute. They were governmental official photographs. Now, with the Phoenix lights, it was a different question. We didn't have photographs. Now, there were some photographs that were taken at the time, and some video, but they were done by private individuals. And it's very difficult for us to use photographs from private individuals because, as targets because people can always take it back later. They can say, oh, I just did that in Photoshop. Or they can be discredited by outside people and saying, oh, that was just. So why did we pick Phoenix Lights? Or why did I decide to pick Phoenix Lights as the third part of this series called Remote Viewing the Aliens? Well, the reason I picked Phoenix Lights was because of the enormous numbers of eyewitnesses. It wasn't just lights that people saw. These so-called lights were, the, uh, were connected to the underbelly of a ship, and that ship was so low to the ground, you could see the underbelly of the ship, and it blocked out most of the sky to the people that were right above it, right below it. So these things were, you know, huge. This was a, a huge object, at least one, maybe more than one, but it was a, it was a huge thing, and the governor of the state saw it as well. So you have a lot of witnesses, at least tens of thousands definitively, and you had potentially hundreds of thousands, but a lot of very high quality witnesses, pilots, you had fire, firemen, uh, rescue operators, we had police, and we had the governor of the state, who was an Air Force officer and a former pilot. Actually, he is a pilot, and an air former, he was a former Air Force officer and a pilot, and he knew every type of flying machine there was out there. And he came out point blank and said, this was not anything he'd ever seen before. And regard to the governmental story that came out six months after the event that, oh, but not by the flight lieutenant, oh, those are just some flares we dropped. Well, flares don't fly in formation over five states. <laughs> they don't hang, yeah, they don't hang up in the air uh, for, you know, an hour and a half at a time. And secondly, they're not connected to the underbelly of a ship that they could see the bottom of. So, I mean, it's, I mean, nothing matched. But the mainstream media very eagerly reported oh that that anomaly which we didn't report on for six months now we have an now we have an excuse for it so we'll report on it now the mainstream media said oh now that was just you know a bunch of flares but the governor of the state came out afterwards and said that was not a set of flares flares don't fly in formation <laughs> and the, i mean it was just so obvious to everybody who saw it. five states or across five states information so what you're talking about is is nothing that corresponds with what the government said it was and you had a huge number of witnesses. So we do not have a set of photos that are official governmental type photos, but we do have uh, an enormous number of witnesses. Now, uh, with regard to the photos, I might as well mention something. The Phoenix Lights event, actually there were a, a few. They happened, there was some similar types of things that happened on other dates, but that happened on a Thursday, March 13th, 1997. Now, Back in 1997, Rex, there wasn't the type of situation you have now where everyone has a cell phone in their pocket and the cell phone has right. a high-quality 1080p camera. Right. Back in those days, you had to have a camera to do it. And it was a film camera, not a digital camera back in those days. And very few people walked around with cameras in those days. And the few people who took photos from right underneath the craft, apparently there was a lot of radiation or something coming from the craft because they, the photos just turned out like all white. And for those people who were far enough away that they weren't affected by that, there were some video and still photos, photographs that were made. But the close photographs had problems with the, the film picking up something that sort of, it was like in the old days when you put your film through an x-ray scanner that was really powerful, it, you know, the film gets affected. So, uh, I don't know if it was actually, but there was something that messed up the film. So anyway, we didn't have a lot of photographs, but it didn't matter. Even if there were a lot of photographs, we could not have used the photographs for the project. We based the project on the definitively tens of thousands of people 
probably close to 100,000 people under Phoenix alone that saw the stuff for over an hour, including the, including the governor of the state. That was enough of us for us to have verifiable content that, you know, it was indisputable because of the number of witnesses. Now, you brought up the radiation. Do, did you guys, were you able to get any verifiable evidence of actual um, radiation? Like No. I, in fact, and I just said radiation. I shouldn't have even said it. I just gave that as an example of how film could be affected by certain things. Okay. For, whatever, for whatever reason, the cameras that were, I've heard that the cameras that were used using film directly underneath the craft, the, the film didn't develop properly. So the, the only th films that did pre develop, the, develop properly were ones that were farther away, off to the side. Sure. So there, there weren't that many cameras to begin with. That were, people didn't walk around with cameras back in those days. And secondly, the few people that did try to get pictures, uh, some of them didn't work because they took the pictures from right underneath. And the ones that did work were off to the side. So we have very, relatively sparse photographic evidence of the event. But... We have enormous eyewitness evidence of the event. I mean, it was literally, it was a big event in Houston. I mean, people were talking to each other on the phone. They were saying, come out, look. I mean, the governor heard about it on the phone from a phone call. And he actually drove out to the, the, the things were hanging around long enough for him to actually drove out, drive out to a, a nice place where he could look up and see the whole thing. So it wasn't like it was sudden. And if you didn't see it in a minute or two, it would be gone. It was like a long, long time, and people had a chance to drive around and talk to each other on the phone and tell people to go out, go, decide what was the best place to look at these things, and so on. So it's as if they wanted to make some type of contact with us, Earth. And, exactly. You know, and I want to jump into, I really liked when you brought up during the beginning of the video, you said that remote viewing is like highly refined consciousness. And when, when Daz is up there talking, and he's doing this, um, you know, he's doing these remote viewing sessions and he's picking up what he's seeing in his mind and then he's writing it down on the whiteboard. One thing that I noticed, Courtney, was he kept saying words that, uh, you know, that are very kinesthetic. He would say, it feels like this is metal. It, it feels like this is uh, yeah. circular. It feels like the outside of this craft has these edges or these lines. These So my question is, I found that fascinating. When he was saying the words feels like, was he really mean? Can you feel things when you remote view, or is it is it just is it just visual? Is it visual and kinesthetic and auditory? No, it's everything. Meaning all the five senses work, but very often a, a very an experienced remote viewer gets the feel of a substance, and that doesn't mean that she or he is actually touching it, but they can have the feel of a substance. Like for example, later on in the video. Daz was saying that it's a very plasticky sense in the like the the surfaces of the inside of the spacecraft had a very clean but also very plasticky feel to it. So it's it's like the mind can go to the location and feel the surfaces as if your physical body was actually feeling the surfaces. But all the five senses work, including hearing, touch, sight, taste, and smell. And he was also talking about the, the description of what he was seeing, obviously, the exterior and the interior. Yeah. When, one thing I noticed on the chalkboard, when he would put the target, a.k.a. 12C, he would then start drawing a line, and he would start from one point, and then he would, take, he would draw this line to another point. And you, you watch the video, and you can tell that unless these people are – are such an incredible actors unless Daz has got a golden globe in acting you know he's he's picking this stuff this stuff up naturally in his mind and he starts going from like point A to point B but when he describes the craft he, he or this this 12C project that he's supposed to pick up he keeps drawing these like pyramid shapes and he's saying I see these real geometrical shapes and they can they, they I can't tell if they're changing or morphing but it's so he was literally describing what people saw and it was just absolutely yeah. incredible the, sh the ship itself had a pyramid-type shape, shape uh, on its side, meaning the best way to think of it, it looked like a carpenter's square. So it had a, an, an angular pyramid type of a shape, and he was picking up that. He got the shape really well. Now, it probably had some vertical element to it, a uh, pyramid-type vertical element that we couldn't see from the ground, but, and he was probably describing that also. But from the ground, it looked like a pyramid on its side. 
And so he was clicking, he was clearly picking up the very triangular or angular shape of the object. And he was also clearly describing that it was in the air. It was above that and everyone down below was looking up at it. So yes, and it's amazing. The I've been doing this with these best remote viewers for a long time. And it's amazing even to me. I mean, when I send these instructions out to them, which is essentially just a an email that says there is a target, do your session, send it to me. That's it. No, they don't get anything more. They don't get anything like um, that. They get nothing more than that. That's it, period. And so when the sessions come in and I click on them and look them over, my jaw drops just as much as your jaw drops. I mean, it's always like, wow. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The level of accuracy for the verifiable components of the data are extraordinary. Now, the verifiable components are important. Every target, every project we do at Farsight has to have a good solid 50% or more verifiable stuff in it. Verifiable stuff is stuff that we know about the target that's absolutely definitive and not in dispute. For example, in the Iapetus target, we had a clear photo of the crater on Iapetus. So we knew it was a barren, icy moon on Iapetus with craters and meteor junk all over the place, and that Saturn was above it, and space was above it, and it was a barren, rocky moon with mountains and craters and everything all around that. And there was this thing on the wall of one of the craters that we were looking at. So all that was verifiable. And so we were looking to see if that verifiable stuff is clearly described. And there is remote viewers did an amazing job. In fact, Dick Algeyer's session on the Iapetus target was probably one of the best sessions I've ever seen. Perhaps one of the best sessions anyone ever has ever anyone has ever seen with respect to drawing the verifiable components describing the moon, the barren moon, the, the wall that he was inside the crater, there was a wall of a crater, that there was meteor stuff all over the place. Now both Daz and Dick both just both found out both described it as it was off planet, it was a meteor crater, and they said this explicitly. Now when it got to the Phoenix Lights project, Daz explicitly said this was an a state in the American Southwest. We're dealing with a desert city and we're dealing with a major event in the air in which huge numbers of people are looking up and he described it as a close encounters type of a situation, a first contact type of a situation where where aliens, ex extraterrestrials were actually making contact with humans. I understand also there was a group of humans on the ground at that time that were actually trying to communicate with these people on the ship and so uh, they might have been led by uh, Stephen Greer, uh, the guy who runs the C-SETI project. Right. And so that was, you know, going on apparently at the same time. And so that is picking up sort of a first contact type of a setting, sort of matched that type of element. But also, you know, his description of Phoenix and the city and the desert, this American Southwest, uh, uh, and the ship and the sky and the lights on the ship and everyone looking at it. I mean, that was like right off the scale. It was really great. And the same thing with Dick. Dick got the same type of stuff. These viewers are so great to work with because in terms of the verifiable stuff, it's like I get carbon copies from both of them. Now, Dick Algeyer is working in Hawaii. Daz Smith is working in UK on the opposite side of the planet. And they have no communication between them whatsoever. No emails or talking or chats or anything like that while the remote viewing is going on. And then they send me sessions that are like carbon copies of each other. And so that tells me right away that the quality of the data is excellent. And then I look at the new data. That's data that we don't have verifiable stuff for, which is once, they de once they've described the desert city, American Southwest, and the thing in the sky, the lights, everyone looking at it from below, they had to get all of that right, plus a lot more that I'm mentioning just now. Then they start describing, well, let me go look at this thing that's in the sky that everybody's looking at. And they both describe the same type of thing. They both describe the craft, a ship. They both go into the ship. They both describe the same occupants of the ship. They describe a, a big guy, uh, you know, with a tall fellow with long hair, long blonde hair, and a bunch of shorter people around him that are like helpers. 
and they both describe the exact same type of persona inside the inside the uh, inside the ship, the personnel inside the ship. So that's really interesting. So so that's unverifiable, but it's it's fascinating that the verifiable stuff for both sessions it was totally correct, and it was duplicated. Both people, both data centers got the same stuff. And then when they went into the ship, even though we can't verify the stuff in the ship, the personnel, it's fascinating that they both got exactly the same stuff. So that leaves us in a situation of saying that the, un, that the new data is very persuasive. So, no, we don't have a video recording of what happened inside the ship. But given that the verifiable stuff is exactly correct and that they both come in with the exact same stuff for inside the ship and they both describe the ship in exactly the same way, that means that the new data are very persuasive. And if I were a betting person, which I'm not, I don't bet, I don't gamble, but if I were a betting person, there's no ambiguity. It's, I would bet that it's totally correct. Well, and, and let me jump in here real quick. When, when Daz talks, he, was, he explained, he jumped into the, the, the people inside the craft. And I remember him saying, I, I wrote these notes down. He said he describes them as tall, thin, long blonde hair, uh, a metallic type suit that has more effect than just your typical clothes. And he talks about uh, a pinkish white skin. And then when, uh, when Dick talks about, um, he, he, he remote views what's inside the craft, and he talks about this tall, Nordic-looking individual that's got pale skin, that has, like, you know, just these amazing physical features that most, you know, men would strive to have, you know, the just awesome hair, uh, tall, uh, nice, nice complexion, uh, a good build. And then he talks about these, these, um, ent- these individuals around him that aren't nearly as smart but they're like his helpers, and he describes them as uh, looking like dwarves or children. But one thing I, that, that really caught my, uh, my eye was when he, said, he made the comment about how this, this tall Nordic-type entity, I guess you, you might call, call him, has the uh, intelligence of somebody that would have 10 PhDs. He has an almost godlike mindset and intelligence. And, and my question is, Courtney... How, how can somebody tap in to the mind of an individual when you're doing remote viewing sessions and say, okay, well, this person has intelligence on physics and electronics, et cetera? Actually, that's one of the great things about remote viewing. There are no boundaries that we know of. Now, I'm not saying that there are no limits to what can be done with remote viewing. I'm just saying we haven't run into the limits yet. So when you remote view something, you can... You know, a very good remote viewer goes right into the mind of whoever is there and actually can communicate. If you were to look at, you know, they can describe the emotions, the the thoughts. Do, do uh, they feel the it? Gen- do, uh, do they feel the emotions? Yeah, they feel it. They actually sense exactly what the person's thinking. In fact, and the emotions and the whole, you know, the, the scope of the mind and so on. So Dick was able to perceive that the guy was a really smart guy. But, you know, if there was a difference between the two sessions between Dick and Des, the, the, the only sort of major difference between both of them is that Dick was sort of very fixated on this guy, this tall guy with the long right. blonde hair. And he stuck his face, his remote viewing face, like right in front of the guy <laughs> and described his eyes that had sort of pupils that looked like that of a cat. Well, so he sort of called him like a cat man. Didn't he say he like shape shifted? He went from looking like a tall Nordic type individual to almost a. He he said he morphed into something that looked like it had giant cat eyes, and and that I found. Yeah, that, well, there was some there was some discussion of that, but then he really kept focusing on the eyes and the person's face, and there was some mention of that. But the, the, if you look at the bulk of the session, the person seemed to look the same throughout the session. But he did mention something about like the capability of morphing. Uh, that might that might meant the telepathic morphing in the sense that you might he might have been able to make himself look different to somebody. Not that the person would actually be different, but make himself look different. But if you look at the actual session itself, you don't see Dick describing this guy changing. He just mentions it once that it, like the guy like has the ability to change or something. But he really focuses on what the guy looks like. Now, when you remote view, you, you leave like a, an element of yourself, like a persona, like a ghost image right there. And normally, people 
human beings cannot perceive that, meaning you cannot perceive when someone else is remote viewing you. Now, there are a lot of people that say, oh, no, that's not correct. You can't perceive it. I perceived it when people were spying at me or looking at me. But invariably, those are people that are deluded. Um, some of them need mental help, psychiatric help, whatever. We, we've got lots of experience, and this upsets a lot of people when I say that, but we have lots and lots of experience. Humans are genetically built so that telepathy and non-physical perception are extremely restricted. And normally speaking, humans cannot perceive when they're being remote viewed. For those people who say, oh no, I've known when people are staring at me, looking at me, I can only say it's crazy on two levels. First of all, nobody would ever do that who knew how to remote view. Meaning, remote viewing requires a blind target done by an outside person. It simply cannot be done otherwise. It, it's different than simply psychic perception done by a natural psychic with that's, that's done with you know, all types of front loading and seeing the person in front of you and you know, having, touching the person's sweater or pictures. I mean, none of that's allowed with remote viewing. With remote viewing, the target has to be done totally blind by a, by a tasker and the viewer, um, uh, the tasker chooses the target, and there's a lot of setup time and a huge amount of investment in an analysis and everything. There has never been, to my knowledge, a situation in which <laughs> all that was set up to remote view somebody's neighbor. It just wouldn't happen. It's crazy. I mean, it's like way too complicated. It's like saying, it's like saying you would build a 500 million watt dam in order to that could power you know, a whole city or something like that in order to light a candle on a New Year's celebration. I mean, it's just crazy. You light a match for something like that. So, I mean, nobody would remote view an individual. But on the other hand... Let me jump in here just, just yeah. real quick. Um, as, as far as the average individual, I mean, that, that makes total sense. Um, but, but wasn't remote viewing created or it initially started that we know of by the Soviets to spy on politicians? Yes, and that's exactly the point. And the politicians... And all the people that were spied on never saw it. They never, they never once saw that they were being remote viewed. And so the point is that when it is done, it's done with a huge amount of preparatory stuff. So nobody that says, oh, someone was spying on me, that person's nuts because it would never happen in the first place. It's too much investment to do something and no one would ever do that. So secondly, all the times that remote viewing has been used to spy on humans, they were always big type targets, military targets uh, inside the Kremlin walls. Uh, you know, they were always stuff where they were really trying to go after some information. Right. The Soviets are trying to spy on what the U.S. is doing or the U.S. is trying to spy on what the Soviets are doing, that type of thing. So they have lots of experience remote viewing people, but there's no experience where the people actually turned around and saw the remote viewer. So with extraterrestrials, especially these advanced extraterrestrials, all that I just said about the human limitations is false. They can see you coming. So they have, we have lots of experience where remote viewers, remote viewing aliens, the aliens can actually turn around and see you and they look right at you. So those limitations of genetically inbuilt limitations simply don't exist for a lot of these aliens. So, and, and this we've known for a very long time. Ingo Swan was tasked to remote view some aliens on the moon right. in a... Yeah, in the, and he described it in the book Penetration. Right. And he was brought down into a super deeply buried facility, uh, U.S. spy facility, yeah. and tasked these spots on the moon. And he didn't know that he was being re told to remote view spots that might have extraterrestrials. He just was remote viewing these spots. And he said, this is the moon. And what are those people there? There's people there. They're like, and, and they were they're naked, turning. weren't they? No, they weren't naked. They were fully clothed, but they were walking into a door of some facility on the moon. And then one of them turned around, looked directly at Ingo, and pointed his finger at Ingo. And then the other person looked as well. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and then the military guy who was monitoring the situation, he did something that we would consider comical today. But back in those days, it could be understood. He yelled at Ingo, no, pull back, pull back. We don't want to be seen doing this. <laughs> Keep his and so... Uh, but, you know, these days, if that ever happened, we would not have stopped the session. We would have just said, keep on going, go right up to the guy who's pointing and go into the guy's mind to find out what he's looking at. So, but back in those days, it was different. So we've known for a long time that extraterrestrials can do this. Many extraterrestrials can do this. So that's very interesting that when Dick Algeyer got in front of this guy, this called him the cat man because he had eyes that had the pupils of like a cat. Um, 
the guy saw him uh, and was very calm about the whole thing. And it, it gave the appearance that they were waiting for him. Now, this is very interesting, Rex. So just consider this. This is something that was happening March 13th, 1997, Thursday. And these guys were apparently waiting for a remote viewer to show up, two remote viewers to show up, coming from the year 2015. <laughs> and then Dick actually initiated the conversation and said, okay, cat man, speak to me. And the guy started to give him a talk. He just started to give him a physics lesson of how they got here. And he described how the nature of time and reality is not what we think it is. And he described that. Anyway, that was a fascinating type of physics lecture on the nature of reality. But the point is that back in 1997, they were actually doing a light show, communicating physically with people on the ground. And they might have been doing this in part because of the group of humans that were on the ground trying to or trying to attract them. So it was like a first encounter type of situation with all the people around Phoenix, tens of thousands of people in 1997. But they were simultaneously and with complete foreknowledge communicating with people in 2015, explaining what they're doing to the people in 1997. So there was a time loop that was involved. And that's the most fascinating thing. They didn't mind explaining to people in 2015 what they were doing physically with people in 1997. And to them, that was like, okay, that's nothing unusual about that. So, but in, in terms of the normal set of events that we do, that, that you normally see in, in, in human life, including science fiction, that was really odd. That was really interesting. That was sort of a high-end type of, wow, moment. Yeah, In Ingo Swan seemed to have, uh, he, he certainly is ahead of his time. I, I read that, I read bits and pieces of that book, and, and I could have sworn that it said he, um, when, when these men in black or these people that picked him up and put him in this underground type base, uh, he remote viewed something that he said, hey, there, there's, naked, there's naked people in this green mist, and, and they said that it was on the, on the moon, but I definitely need, need to redo that. Uh, re yeah, I, I don't remember that at all. He definitely, he definitely ran across aliens walking, uh, entering a door of a facility on the moon, but I don't remember anything about naked well, let, let's jump back to this, this session on, on the Phoenix Lights, and um, I wanted to bring up the, the description of the interior that Daz talks about. First, he, you know, he, he, he draws all these pyramids and these triangular shapes, and he says these real, he sees these real jagged lines and geometrical, um, you know, straight lines, and then he, he remote views the inside of it, and he brings up how it's very s cyclical, uh, circular, and the life forms that are inside this craft um, walk and talk and do everything with just complete I, I, I'm trying to look at the right think of the right word here to use but they they do not waste anything no energy no no everything that they do has a purpose it's very fluid and then when Dick describes the interior of the craft he describes even the, the same tunnel on the inside and it, it's almost perfect as to what Daz brings up but I noticed that the Dick didn't talk a lot about the outside of the craft. He didn't bring up the the geometrical, like the, the straight lines and the the actual triangular shapes. But he really got into the interior of it, which ma which matched what Daz said, as well as the the individuals on the inside of it. But, but actually, actually, Rex, let me make a comment here. Uh, Rex, Daz is a graphic artist by profession. That's how he earns his money. So when people remove you, they go in with the skill set that they already have. So Dick Elgeyer is a reporter for 30 years. He was the face of the news in Hawaii for 30 years. He was like one of the main newscasters for all of Hawaii. And he's a celebrity newscaster. And he's retired now, but, you know, for 30 years, that's what he did. So when you see Daz as a graphics artist go in, it's natural for him to start describing the angular shapes. And when you're talking about the pyramid shapes and things, you're not talking about pyramids on the ground. He was talking about the triangular shapes of this thing in the air. Right. And and when you when you see someone like that do it, he does go after the shapes and recreates those shapes and the drawings. And so, for example, when we did the Great Pyramid of Giza, he was really great in describing the the shapes of the big blocks that were being moved into place 
with the alien technology. And it was really fascinating to see him draw those blocks, those three-dimensional draw blocks. But, you know, that's what a graphic artist gets paid to do, so he can do that. On the other hand, Dick approached it more like an investigative reporter. There's a something in the air. Okay, he draws a craft, not spending too much time worrying about the absolute big shape, but clearly showing, I mean, the absolute sort of the geometry of the shape. But he describes it clearly that there's this big craft that's in the sky. Everybody's looking at it, lights coming out, and zooms in, and then he zooms into it. And that's the type of thing that an investigative reporter would do. Now, one of the things that an investigative reporter does is talk to people at the scene. They stick a microphone in front of you and say, and they ask questions and say, what's going on here? And so that's what Dick ended up doing. He saw this main guy. He saw the exact same guy that Daz saw. Daz described the person, drew the person, uh, you know, described what was going on, described the, the feel of the interior, described what the interior was like, what it was about, what, it was, what was going on in the inside. Dick, on the other hand, stuck a mic in front of the guy, the main guy, and said, okay, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he they did. go in with the, right. they go they go in with the skill set that they already have. Daz went in with the skill set of a graphic artist, which we needed. Dick went in with the skill set of an investigative reporter, which we also needed. And, and I want to jump in. I'm glad you brought that up. That makes so much sense now. You know, they're they're looking at things through their mind, and everybody has a different perspective and a different consciousness. But one thing that, that really set me back was when Dick said, you know, he's doing this, this remote viewing session and um, he's, he's, you can tell he's like, he's taking deep breaths and he's really trying to, to visualize stuff in his mind. He's closing his eyes and he goes, okay, this is after he describes this, this tall Nordic type being that's got such intelligence with these dwarfs that he calls them, these, these children looking dwarfs around him that aren't as intelligent like his helpers. He says they're not children, but they look like them. And then he starts to, he goes, okay. So tell me something. And he starts closing his eyes and he's focusing and he goes, and he starts talking about how uh, this, this Nordic, it's, it's almost as if this, this entity tells him something. And I was like, wow, are you channeling this information? Are you, cha is he telling you something or are you just tapping into his mind? And no, in that situation, it was clear that he was, that the entity, the, the alien was, was telling him something. Now that doesn't mean that he was telling him something with his with a verbal uh, spoken word like we use, like we're using right now in this interview. But, well, let me explain it this way, Rex. When you dream, or when I dream, or when anyone dreams, you will never have a dream in which you actually see yourself talking to another person with your mouth going up and down and you're moving air. Like, like you speak physically here. You, will, you can never remember such a dream because it never happens. When you dream, you communicate telepathically, and it works perfectly well. I mean, you do convey words. When you dream, you do have words. I mean, you can, but they're not because the mouth opens and a, a, a flow of air comes out of it and vibrates the vocal cords. You don't ever have a situation where you can remember such a thing. And if you are interested in it, start taking notes of your dreams, and you'll notice that and, you know, I take, I record my dreams constantly for years worth. And I've never had a situation where I could actually see my mouth going up and down and air coming out and vibrating vocal cord type of talking. But there's a lot of communication with words type stuff and it works fine. So that's the type of communication. So it's a telepathic type of communication. And when we report the communication, we report it back with words that we understand in the English language. But the words are not being used. It's not English language words that are being used, but it's the mental flavor of those words that's being conveyed. And it's being conveyed in the same way that you get those words conveyed as a dream, because you're not, you're not moving air over vocal cords, but you're still picking up words which you translate to actual things that you can write down if you're writing down your dreams. So you can say, okay, I was saying this to that person in your dream, but you never actually witness yourself moving the mouth and actually saying it. But the words get translated into physical type words so easily. So the communication in the non-physical realm that we use before we were born, before we were in physical bodies, works perfectly well. And that's the type of communication that you have when you're in the dream state, and that's the type of communication that you have when you're remote viewing. And so the guy, that Nordic type alien guy, he was communicating to Dick in the same way that someone would communicate to somebody else in a dream. The words came through, and Dick 
wrote those words down, meaning the physical mind translates those, the meanings that were coming across as words, and that's what, he, that's what he reported to us. He didn't write them down, but he explained them. He drew pictures and then explained them verbally what was actually being said. But the communication is as clear, as unambiguous, perhaps more clear and more unambiguous, than communication that we're having right now using physical words with air flowing out over the vocal cords. So the communication is rock solid, but it's not the same as our physical communication. <laughs> yeah, no, you've never had it. It's never happened. It doesn't happen to anybody. It's, it's one of the few things that I'm always surprised that people don't observe more often. Uh, it's not really out. And that's because when the communication happens in the dream state, the communication is so clear. You just sort of don't even think, well, did I see my mouth move? And like, was there air coming over my vocal cords? The, it, the communication is so clear, you don't even question that. But the reality is, yeah, it never happens. I mean, it never happens. So it's a fascinating type of thing, nonverbal communication, telepathic communication. Anyway, that's what Dick had. And the, the thing that the guy decided to tell Dick was that the transportation that they use, faster than light transportation, is based on an understanding of physical reality that's much different from the physical reality, the understanding of physical reality that is currently dominant in mainstream physics that's taught in the universities throughout the world. He was based, the guy basically told Dick that we think of our reality, well, in the physics sense, we think of our reality in something that they call Minkowski space. And that means three physical dimensions plus the dimension of time. And we think of that as being solid. That's all there is. There's a physical dimension, three physical dimensions, and then there's time. And the physical dimension changes as you move along in time. And once you move from one point in time to the next point in time, all the physical stuff that was in the previous point has gone away. That you only have one physical reality, period. So the guy was basically saying that is not the correct view of reality. The guy was saying that, and he used the example of a star. He said, with stars, we look at them and see a nuclear furnace. We look at them and look at, like there's a nuclear reaction going on and emitting a lot of light. But he said, that's not actually what a star is. There are more dimensions than what we would normally think of. It's, we don't, there's not just Minkowski space type stuff. We have three physical dimensions in time. There's actually other dimensions besides that. And what happens is that the stars that you see are actually holes in the three-dimensional realities that we have, and you're having bleed through from enormous energy coming through from those other dimensions. And so what you get with a star is a connection to those other dimensions, and that's how they travel. They don't travel linearly like we think of movement from one spot to the next by walking across their living room floor or sending a spacecraft into orbit and shipping it out to Mars or some other place. What they do is they access the other dimensions and come out in this three-dimensional spot in a, separate, in a different location. This has been a... I'm a mathematician. Uh, I work at a, in the social science program of a major university. I don't do any remote viewing work there, but I, nonetheless, I am a mathematician. This is something that's very well understood among mathematicians. And it was described in some popular literature uh, in a short story called The Flatlanders. And the basic idea is that for people living on a flat surface, you don't realize that there can be an interior. For example, let's say you're an ant and you're walking on the surface of a balloon. Well, as far as you're concerned, that surface of a balloon is a two-dimensional space. It's just a flat surface. Well, it's not a flat surface, but it's a curved surface. But as far, you can walk on it. But as far as you're concerned, it just goes right, left, forward, and backwards. There's no depth to it. But us in three-dimensional space look at that ant that's crawling on the surface of the balloon and saying, that ant is such an idiot. You know, that ant doesn't realize that it could go right through the balloon if it had the ability and get to the other side more quickly. You don't have to go around the outside of the balloon. So that's what the Flatlanders are. The Flatlanders are people that believe they are on a surface and all of reality is just there. But these other dimensions, the dimension that gives depth to the balloon, is not known. It's, it's, it's something that the ant doesn't understand actually exists. So the ant only thinks in terms of transportation by walking around on the surface. Whereas if you had a super intelligent ant, the super intelligent ant might be able to figure out 
that the other side of the balloon is actually a lot closer than than the uh, than the other ants were thinking. And so if you could access that other dimension, that depth dimension, you could get from one spot to the next spot and circumvent the long walk around the outside. So basically, that's a type of thing that the extraterrestrial was conveying to Dick. And this idea of stars being holes in the fabric of Minkowski space, that three-dimensional space, accessing these other dimensions, is actually very similar to our Big Bang theory, in the sense that what you got with the Big Bang theory is a huge rupture in the wall of space-time, or the, this, the Minkowski, the, what we would consider the concept of Minkowski space, and this huge amount of energy from other dimensions, from other realm, emerges and fills out, populates the universe as we see it. And it's still apparently expanding from that Big Bang type of initial starting point. And there's controversies about the Big Bang idea itself, but nonetheless, there's still pretty much understanding that the universe is still expanding and that there's a rush outwards and so that type of emergence of all of this energy coming from one central spot is a type of generic phenomenon that we see with the stars itself and that we see with spacecraft going from one spot to the next in apparent defiance of the laws of relativistic physics which says that that type of thing is not possible but with the context of these other dimensions it is possible and I wanted to bring up the uh, during the sessions that Dick and Daz did, especially Daz, he was talking about how he felt these uh, life forms, he calls them, these shorter individuals mm -hmm. that had brown skin, brown hair, around five yes. feet tall. But he said that they were like these primitive, he felt that they were primitive and they were looking up at this this craft or this incredible anomaly and, and just going, wow. And the people that were actually in the craft were just like, eh, you know, this is normal for us. This is yeah. no big deal. And then, and then he talked about different timelines. He's like, I can't tell if this is two timelines or if this is one. And he brought, and then another thing that just, I, I, I was trying to wrap my mind around was when he brought up the, he's like, okay, there's this underground thing. And he was talking about something underground and then Dick talked about this like light beam or something that connected the the uh, craft to the ground. What what's your interpretation on that, Courtney? Well, you know that's some of the complexity of the overall sessions, and sometimes it's better for me not to offer an interpretation for some of these complexities because I don't have an understanding of all the stuff that comes across in these sessions. So that's why it's good for people to actually look at the sessions themselves. Now, mind you, in the old military days, all remote viewing sessions were done with paper and pen. And they were dreadfully boring to watch being done, and not very few people wanted to actually see them on paper and pen, with paper and pen, because you're just looking at writing on the writing, writing and trying to interpret the writing. So moving to video changed everything, because when we started to do all of our sessions on video, people get to see the entire project. And like when you saw it, you were fascinated and were really interested in having the interview. It was like you had questions. You had Because the, the remote viewers are describing it live right then and there. They're not relaying it to something that they remember having looked at. They're right then on there on camera, totally blind to the target, yet the level of accuracy is so extraordinary. The, the, the audience is at the edge of their seat, dropping their mouth to the ground. I mean, it's like amazing stuff. So when you ask questions like that, I'm saying, you know, one of the reasons we like presenting these video remote viewing projects is so that everybody can be their own analyst. Everybody can see the data, all of the data, come in just as it was originally done and have that sort of numb mind shock experience of, whoa, this is amazing, and then try to figure these things out. So you're asking some really great questions. And I, I don't think it's actually really valuable for me to speculate on all of them because this is where the value of publishing the original data is all about. People get to watch these things and figure these things out themselves. It's not something that they have to rely on an authority to tell them what to believe. They can see it all themselves and say, well, I saw it and I know what I, I know how to interpret that. So you're asking questions that actually point to some of the basic elements of the way we do remote viewing now, which is it's new, it's exciting, it's edgy, it's different, 
And when you watch the sessions live on video, which are available right on our website, Courtney, uh, 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 www.farsight.org, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T.org, you can link to it as a DVD or as a video on demand immediately. You, it's a life-changing experience to actually watch this stuff because you're watching the original data. You're not watching somebody like me explaining it and just like take it on raw faith. You're actually seeing it original by itself. And it's beyond exciting. It, we've entered one of the most exciting periods of time for remote viewing research that has ever existed. I must add, Rex, that we have a new project on the, in the works. Great. And those people who should want to get prepared for it, you're going to have to hold on to your seats when we get to it. It'll be as earth-stopping as all of our other projects. And the best way to get prepared for it is to watch our previous projects, especially the projects like the... Uh, Phoenix Lights, Cydonia, Iapetus, but also 9-11, the 9-11 events, and also the Great Pyramid of Giza project, which is available now for free on YouTube. And you can get to that from our website as well, farsight.org. And also the um, Atlantis project, which is also available for free on YouTube. So learning about us before these new projects come out allow the audience members to more fully appreciate when we come out with these brand new things. And I tell you what's coming out, you need to be prepared for. So uh, it's good to actually watch these things and learn about remote viewing because we're on a roll and we're really enjoying doing these projects. And it's an exciting time to be alive. Rex, I want to thank you so much for inviting me here. It's been great. It's been fantastic. Thank you. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord, for the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts. Or you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.theproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? If you have information that the world needs to see and hear, send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night. From the hive mind, this is Rex Bear, hosting Leap Project. The Leap Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leap Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on-scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. All right, so Dr. Brown, it's great to have you on the show. I saw the video that you put together with Dick and um, Daz for the Phoenix Lights. I know back in the late 90s when that event happened, there was a lot of stuff that went around on the internet and other forums and newspapers, and so many people saw these, these Phoenix Lights that it really did send a shock around the world. But then a couple weeks or a few weeks later when the government came out with the official reason as to why it happened, they tended to mock those that thought it might be some type of extraterrestrial encounter. And with the Farsight Institute that you have, um, that you direct, incredible remote viewers, and when I watched this video, I, I watched the, you know, first you had Daz up there putting together actually what he saw, and he was writing it out on the, uh, on the whiteboard, and he kept putting together these geometrical shapes that looked like pyramids. You know, it looked like a uh, like a triangle, basically. So 
But I just wanted to ask you, what was it that made you decide to remote view Phoenix Lights? Well, Rex, look, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question because everyone always asks, why do we pick a particular project? And you have no idea how many suggestions for projects were emailed every day, meaning people say, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? So, you know, why do we do what we do? That's a real good question. Well, with the, with the Phoenix Lights, it was clearly an extraterrestrial type of target. By the way, when the government came out with its explanation, it said they sent a flight lieutenant out to have a news briefing. And it was six months after the Phoenix Lights. So the government was silent for six months. And the news media was essentially, mainstream news media was essentially silent as well. However, the, the lights themselves were not just lights. First of all, they were witnessed over five states, including Sonora, Mexico, and potentially hundreds of thousands of people. But definitively over Phoenix alone, where they hovered for the longest time, was for over an hour, was uh, at, uh, at least tens of thousands of people in Phoenix alone, including the governor of the state, Fife Symington. So there was a huge number of witnesses. Now, when we do projects at the Farsight Institute, we work with the absolute best remote viewers on the planet. And we are training new remote viewers, but we've been, remote, we've been doing projects with Dick Algar from Hawaii and Dick Dad Smith from the UK for a number of years. And those two are really the best on the planet right now. And they use military procedures that were developed by the US military and used for espionage purposes. But they're a little bit, and I don't mean this in a, in a, in a uh, critical sense at all, but they're a little bit like prima donnas and I am too, I guess. <laughs> and they get, they get a little bit finicky, and what they really, really want is mainstream acceptance with what they do. And so they have always hesitated to have like remote viewing targets that involved extraterrestrials because they didn't want the extra woo-woo factor of UFO extraterrestrial stuff. They wanted people to focus on the remote viewing stuff itself. So for years, I promise them, don't worry, I won't give you any extraterrestrial targets. No, no, I won't give you any UFO type targets. And of course I was lying because I can never tell them what I will or will not do. And, <laughs> but I wanted them to be surprised when it happened. And I waited until I thought it was solid that they were believing that they'd never get one. And <clears throat> fearing that they might quit on me if I did it twice, I constructed a project that had three UFO type, extraterrestrial type, alien type, targets at once and there were four targets and they just thought they were going after some single thing but the common theme was extraterrestrial ufo type things and so the first one was the so-called face on mars in cydonia and the reason i chose that one was because it had a clear nasa picture with very clear perpendicular and parallel lines on it that could not have been naturally made because nature doesn't make perfectly parallel and perpendicular lines so uh, like a border around the thing. So uh, that was clearly an anomaly that had to be answered. We had, a, an, uh, we had an official set of pictures from a official governmental source. Then we dealt with an alien facility that was on a wall of a crater in Iapetus, the moon of Saturn. And the reason I took that one is it was very clear in the photo that there was some set of structures on the wall of the crater, something that was obviously not made by just a meteor crash. And so we had, again, an official governmental photo released by NASA, taken by the Cassini space probe. And what is that on the wall of the crater? So again, we had something that was not in dispute. They were governmental official photographs. Now, with the Phoenix lights, it was a different question. We didn't have photographs. Now, there were some photographs that were taken at the time and some video, but they were done by private individuals. And it's very difficult for us to use photographs from private individuals because, as targets because people can always take it back later. They can say, oh, I just did that in Photoshop. Or they can be discredited by outside people and saying, oh, that was just. So why did we pick Phoenix Lights? Or why did I decide to pick Phoenix Lights as the third part of this series called Remote Viewing the Aliens? Well, the reason I picked Phoenix Lights was because of the enormous numbers of eyewitnesses. It wasn't just lights that people saw. These so-called lights were, the, uh, were connected to the underbelly of a ship 
and that ship was so low to the ground, you could see the underbelly of the ship, and it blocked out most of the sky to the people that were right above it, right below it. So these things were, you know, huge. This was a, a huge object, at least one, maybe more than one, but it was a, it was a huge thing, and the governor of the state saw it as well. So you have a lot of witnesses, at least tens of thousands, definitively, and you had potentially hundreds of thousands, but a lot of very high-quality witnesses, pilots, you had fire, firemen, uh, rescue operators, we had police, and we had the governor of the state, who was an Air Force officer and a former pilot. Actually, he is a pilot, and an air former, he was a former Air Force officer and a pilot, and he knew every type of flying machine there was out there, and he came out point blank and said, this was not anything he'd ever seen before. And regard to the governmental story that came out six months after the event, that, oh, but not by the flight lieutenant, oh, those are just some flares we dropped. Well, flares don't fly in formation over five states. They don't 